Hey friends, today I'm going to talk about life on Mars, maybe, and I'm going to talk about bad science and bad science methodology, and I'm going to revisit an old nemesis from the past, Ron Gabriel Joseph. Ah, okay. In 1976, a pair of space probes, the Viking orbiters, arrived at Mars and they started taking photos of the surface as a prelude to dropping landers that would make closer examinations of Martian geology. I recall being enthusiastic about the science because it was exciting to see what Mars actually looked like. Unfortunately, this is the image that got much of the public excited. It was data, sure, and a contribution to the volume of information pouring back to Earth but what we, what we mainly heard about in the late night talk radio amid the growing volume of a mean talk show chatter, chatter was this one un, overinterpreted feature in the Cydonia region, the so-called face on Mars. NASA ignored it since there were other more interesting phenomena to discuss. And this was clearly on the level of seeing faces in clouds or rocky outcrops. Disappointingly, a kind of bizarre crank cottage industry sprung up around this trivial bit of rock. In particular, Richard C. Hoagland, an uneducated pseudoscientist with a highly inflated ego, he claims to have invented something called hyperdimensional physics, but he only has a high school education, insisted that NASA had photographed not only a face, but a whole ruined Martian city, complete with a pyramid, a fortress, an underground base, roads, and unjustifiable levels of detail somehow extracted from blurry, low-resolution images. It was absurd. But, you know, we all said to ourselves that this nonsense would eventually blow over. If nothing else, future Mars probes would require better resolution images, showing that all the extrapolated baloney generated from JPEG artifacts were false. All the kooks with Photoshop would be shown to be wrong, and Richard Hoagland would run away with his tail between his legs. It took 20 more years, but eventually NASA delivered with the Mars Global Surveyor and Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, with much sharper imagery, much higher levels of detail, and we could finally get relatively close-up photos of Mars. That'll silence the crackpots we expected. So we got much better images of the face on Mars. Note that no one took the face claims seriously at NASA, these were just part of a thorough survey of the Martian surface. And there it was, revealed in all its true glory. A hill with a fractured surface that created a pattern of light and shadow that some people mistook for a face. Case closed, right? We're done with the goofy claims of Hoagland and others. Wrong. They have a conclusion and they are sticking with it, no matter what evidence goes against it. So now Hoagland claims he knew all along that it wasn't going to be a smoothly sculpted face, that he knew it was going to be asymmetrical, and that's because it's supposed to be half man, half cat face. You can't win against these guys. You could drop a Mars rover right on Sidonia. It could cruise around every bump and feature the so-called face, showing that it's a natural pile of rubble, and they'd still be imposing their interpretations on it. And there are rovers on Mars. They haven't explored the face, but as they've rambled about, sampling the environment and taking photos, have they found evidence of life? NASA says no. But they've found provocative evidence of free water on the surface of ancient Mars with signs of erosion and rills in the channels of now desiccated streams, which is cool. Could there have been life on Mars a billion years ago? It's possible. It just hasn't been found. The absence of evidence, or even the presence of counter-evidence, will not hinder the fringe who are convinced that there is life on Mars. They'll make up evidence if they need to, which brings us to the modern day, and a familiar name to me at least, Ron Gabriel Joseph. Oh boy. Now, I've dealt with Ron Gabriel Joseph at length before, and I'm not going to rehash it all again. Let's keep it simple. Joseph has some credentials. He went to college in the 1970s. So did I. But he is affiliated with no institution other than his very own self-created institute 
called Astrobiology Associates, which has no formal accreditation or recognition. It just has a web website that Joseph made. He self-publishes books on sex and evolution and aliens and intelligence and mysticism. But again, these have zero academic weight. As I showed in a prior video, his other claim to fame is that he calls his website cosmology.com a scientific journal and publishes shoddy work by his panspermia-leaning cronies and himself, calling it peer-reviewed. All of his credentials are illusory and nonsensical, but they allow him to strut and preen and call himself a Renaissance man. One of the things he does is look at lots of photos taken by the Mars rover, which are freely published by NASA, and try to see things in them that aren't really there. For instance, he claims that there are fields of Martian desert that are littered with humanoid skulls, which he put in one of his self-published books. He also claims to have spotted tentacled arthropods and live humanoids strolling about, all claims which he says have been suppressed by a Jewish conspiracy. I can tell it rankles that he hasn't published in real journals, but then again, his work is obviously not going to pass muster if he's seeing fields of skull, skulls in Mars rover photos. Which brings us to the latest development in the saga of Ron Joseph. His latest thing is to pare his claims down to just one absurdity at a time, which is a smart move. He makes one outrageous assertion in each paper, which gives reviewers far fewer targets to justify rejection, and he's even getting published in a legitimate mainstream peer-reviewed journal. His one claim now is that he has seen mushrooms in photos taken by landers on other planets. Yeah, you can laugh. It's ridiculous. He claims to have found massive quantities of mushrooms sprouting on Venus and Mars. So first, let's deal with his 2019 paper. Life in, on Venus and the Interplanetary Transfer of Biota from Earth in the journal Astrophysics and Space Science, in which he looked at photos from the 1982 Russian probe Venera 13. That robot lasted all of two hours in the harsh environment of Venus, where the temperature was 457 degrees centigrade, that's 855 degrees Fahrenheit for my fellow Americans, and the pressure was equivalent to 89 Earth atmospheres. It's impressive that the probe lasted as long as it did. Joseph claims that some of the photographs showed mushrooms, or mushroom fungi lichen, on the surface. I'll let you judge whether you're convinced or not. Remember, we're at a temperature hot enough to melt lead. Imagine cooking mushrooms at 850 degrees Fahrenheit. My oven only goes up to 500. I don't think it's reasonable to consider these small blobs to be mushrooms or anything organic, for that matter. It's interesting that apparently the editors insisted he include the phrase in his caption for this figure that it must be stressed that morphology alone is not proof of life. Yeah? Really? But the only evidence he presents in the entire paper is that they look like mushrooms. Joseph does discuss the existence of organisms that survive high pressure, or 100% CO2, but when it comes to temperature, he rather limply mentions that bacteria have been found in hot springs at 122 degrees centigrade, and that it has been suggested that microorganisms could exist in the cooler upper atmosphere of Venus. But that is totally irre irrelevant to his claim of seeing large puffballs on the surface at 450 degrees centigrade. I don't see how it ever got published. It's a silly and unjustifiable paper. I noticed, though, that in the same issue that, Chin, that Chandra Wickramasinghe also published a paper, and he's a very silly man. I wonder if he has some clout with the dictators, but I'll return to him in a moment. Okay, so he succeeded in getting one ridiculous paper in a legitimate journal. Can he do it again? He's trying. He has submitted a paper to Astrophysics and Space Science, Hey, they fell for it once, maybe they'll do it again. And it's titled, Life on Mars, Colonies of Photosynthesizing Mushrooms in Eagle Crater, the Hematite Hypothesis Review Refuted. Just the title should throw up red flags on the article. 
photosynthesizing mushrooms? What are those? Mushrooms don't do photosynthesis, although I suppose you could say these are Martian mushrooms, which are special. Note, however, that nowhere in the paper does Joseph present any evidence that the things he sees are carrying out photosynthesis. Like the Venus paper, all he has is photos of the Martian surface provided by NASA, which he then overinterprets the heck out of. All he has is a picture is pictures of small round rocks, which he says looks like mushrooms. His methodology for determining that these are mushrooms is simple. He did a Google and Bing image search with the keywords rocks plus mushroom and a few variants on that and discovered the images he found on Earth, Google, Earth, and Bing on Earth look different than the Martian rocks. Not one of these abiotic specimens resembled in size, shape, and form the mushroom lichen-like specimens photographed on Eagle Crater. The only terrestrial analogs for the specimens presented in this paper are the fruiting bodies of mushrooms and lichens, that is, living organisms. QED. I have to say, though, it's really annoying how he treats mushroom and lichen as synonymous throughout the paper. And of course, when I searched Google and Bing, I found lots of photos of mushroom-shaped rocks. Only problem with his methodology, though, is that people generally don't take close-up photos of tiny round rocks and sand, allowing to dismiss all of the results of the search and make a sweeping statement that nothing other than mushrooms look like NASA's photos. Unfortunately for him, there is a better alternative explanation provided by NASA. These are hematites. The small spherules on the Martian surface in this close-up image are near Fram Crater, visited by NAR NASA's Mars Exploration Rover Opportunity during April 2004. The area shown is 1.2 inches, 3 centimeters across. The view comes from the microscopic imager on Opportunity's rob robotic arm with color information added from the rover's panoramic camera. These are examples of the mineral concretions nicknamed blueberries. Opportunity's investigation of the hematite-rich concretions during the rover's three-month prime mission in early 2004 provided evidence of a watery ancient environment. Okay, I can believe that. They're not blueberries. They're little conglomerations of hematite. Joseph claims to have refuted this hypothesis. His refutation consists entirely of stating the Eagle Crater environment has never was never conducive to creating hematite, and the spherical hematite hypothesis is refuted. How does he know? How does he know the history of this particular crater? Anyway, it's an incredibly bad paper. Both the Venus and Mars papers have shoddy methodology, stupid conclusions, and should have been instantly recognized as crack pottery. But the Venus paper was accepted and published, while the more recent Mars paper was accepted and is awaiting publication, although now it has been withdrawn. The so-called discovery of mushrooms on Mars was widely publicized in the tabloids, and Science Alert quickly published an article questioning the quality of the work and its authors, and the paper was at first delayed and then withdrawn or suggested that it ought to be scrutinized by more reviewers. Inverse also interviewed Ron Joseph, which was revealing. I'll include a link below. You should take a look at it. It's kind of enlightening to see what he actually has to say. Uh, on my part, I wrote to the journal editors. I wrote, I'm about to publish some criticism of Ron Gabriel Joseph, who published a paper in your journal titled Life on Venus and the Interplanetary Transfer of Biota from Earth. I'm curious to know how a paper that used a few blurry photos from the Venera 13 probe in 1982 to argue for photographic evidence that mushrooms existed on the surface of Mars managed to get published. The paper is embarrassingly bad and not of the quality I'd expect from astrophysics and space science. Further, I understand he has a paper pending publication that purports that mushrooms are flourishing on the surface of Mars, again, solely based on interpretations of photos of rounded objects, which NASA has determined are hematite pebbles. How is this stuff slipping past your editors and reviewers? These egregiously silly papers can only damage the reputation of your journal. 
Okay, so I sent that off, and I'm happy to report that they replied with an appropriate answer. They said, we are currently investigating the published article you have flagged, that is the one on mushrooms on Venus, and the process by which it was accepted carefully following publishing best practice. With regards to the second paper you refer to, this has been withdrawn for consideration by the author following the editorial decision that further peer reviews were warranted for consideration of public publication. I think I understand how this happened now. It's an astrophysics journal. They got submissions about astrobiology and just farmed them out to a pool of known astrobiologists for review. That's reasonable. The sad fact is, though, that the pool has been tainted by the presence of a group I call the Panspermia Mafia, a group of weirdly ideological fanatics with degrees who are followers of Chandra Wickramasinghe, who was in turn a student of Fred Hoyle. Almost all the goofy claims you see in the tabloids about proof of Martian life or diatoms found in meteorites or diseases falling out of space can trace back to this prolific collective of spacey fringe scientists. Many of them initially publish in Ron Joseph's fake journals, and then use those citations to pretend greater authority in the field. Further, most of the articles they write are rehashed versions of other articles. There's a lot of self-plagiarism going on here, which you can see just by looking at the main page of his pretend science journal, the Journal of Astrobiology and Space Science Research. What's most telling is that Ron Joseph withdrew the paper on the mere threat of having it scrutinized by additional scientists. He knows that if he gets reviewers outside of the panspermia mafia, his work will be quickly and appropriately trashed. So I have some suggestions for all journals that might publish articles on astrobiology, which is a legitimate and interesting subject. To improve the quality of the work instantly, first of all, Reject any articles by Ron Gabriel Joseph, even if he's only a co-author on site. He's a known crackpot and pest. Anyone familiar with the field has to know this by now. Two, similarly, Chandra Wickramasinghe has lost all credibility. I noticed that Astrophysics and Space Science has published reviews by this guy. Why? Seeing his name on a paper has got to be a big, bright red flare by now. Three, journals typically have lists of reliable reviewers that are sent papers. Look at some of Joseph's papers and immediately strike his co-authors off your reviewer pool. They look at the, the other way at outrageously bad methodology as long as the conclusions fit their preconceptions. Now, I'm not an astrobiologist. So I can't say this is someone qualified in that specific field. But as a biologist, I think it's safe to say that someone who confuses lichens with mushrooms suggests that mushrooms are photosynthetic and regards something rounded as automatically evidence for a biological origin is almost certainly a bad scientist. Okay. Time to take a look at all these lovely patrons who've been supporting my work. Let's just let these names scroll on by. So many people. I think this is called a wall crawl, maybe. Which fits with my usual spider obsession. Yeah, so that's what we're seeing here is a wall crawl. All these people are good spiders. That's what I like to think of them as. Okay, I'm going to let it go there. Thanks again, everyone. I really appreciate your support. Thank you for listening to me ramble on about this kook who's been pestering me. You know, I'd really like to meet Ron Joseph someday and have a conversation with him. I don't think he'd like to see me, though. I'm, he'd probably accuse me of being fat and a woman or something. Okay, talk to you all later.